I think it's terrifying. I mean, this seems potentially like one of the biggest stories of my lifetime. And I don't care if it's about UFOs or whatever you call it. Something that we don't understand is getting very close to our military aircraft. I mean, first, tell us what the purpose of the program was and why it was so secret. It is uh, President Trump's belief that the United States must remain as dominant in space as we are on land and sea in the air. And your charge is to see to that mission with the United States Space Force, to defend this nation and to defend our ideals. Uh, what the federal government is doing when it comes to uh, UFOs, so if I could uh, just ask you, uh, are we going to commit, uh, are you going to commit more resources to, to exploring uh, UFOs and open the documents uh, to the public? Something that we can't explain has happened. That is correct. Look, it's holding, it's just stalled out there. I'll do whatever you uh, ask me to do, including total transparency. And I got to tell you, there's probably some pretty good transparency needed there. There's no doubt about that. Before you leave office, will you let us know if there's aliens? Because this is the only thing I really want to know. I, I want to know what's going on. Would you ever open up Roswell and let us know what's really going on? You know, the president of the United States since Eisenhower has not been read into, which is military term for briefed, on what are called unacknowledged special access projects. There are millions and millions of people that want to go there, that want to see it. I won't talk to you about what I know about it, but it's very interesting. I don't believe he has particularly more information than some of the others, like Ronald Reagan had quite a bit of information on the um, extraterrestrial and UFO subject, but the information was cherry-picked with a lot of people that would like to know what's going on. So you're saying you may declassify, oh. you'll, you'll, you'll take it? Well, I'll, I, I'll have to think about that one. So I know what is happening with the current president is that the people around him are ones that are selected to provide a certain type of information. And it is usually cherry-picked intelligence so that the president will respond to the subject the way they want them to these classified operatives. So people have to understand the nature of an unacknowledged special access project. And most people would assume, it'd be fair to say, that because you're the President of the United States, you have an all access pass to all these compartmented operations that are very classified, uh, but they do not. And that is one of the urban myths, is that the President knows everything or can find out about everything. What I have found is that depending on the presidency, and I briefed and put a briefing together for every president since Bill Clinton and briefed personally his CIA director. And what I found is, for example, when Bill Clinton inquired about this subject, he was denied any information. His CIA director was tasked with looking into it. He was denied information. So I was invited to come up to Washington, even though I'm an emergency doctor, but I had collected a large archive on this issue and briefed the director of the CIA. And that was when I discovered that the nature of the secrecy is so compartmented that you know, some people say well, it's above top secret. Well, there is no classification above top secret. What it is is the compartment you're in. And the ones that are special access projects are very restricted. And the ones that are unacknowledged special access projects are off the books and only the people in that sealed compartment know about what they're doing and that is how it's structured. And that architecture structure evolved from the 50s forward. And uh, so no president since Eisenhower has had full access to these projects, which is of course illegal and unconstitutional, which is why my group, SeriousDisclosure.com, we're gathering together people to change that. But I think the current president has access to a point but he need, you know, any of, anyone like that is in a bubble. So, you know, when you enter the White House, I mean, say you're a businessman or a peanut farmer like Jimmy Carter or whatever, you get into the White House and the people that are surrounding in the national security apparatus, most of them don't know about this issue. 
the ones that are appointed and come and go every few years. But there's a permanent bureaucracy, a few of whom would be read into or briefed on the subject. But those people will only tell the president what they think the president will respond to in a favorable way for them, strategically. For example, there's been all this information coming out recently about um, UFOs being cho chased by our Navy pilots off the coast of California, et cetera. It's all being on CNN, New York Times. Those objects are most likely Lockheed Martin top secret skunk works object. A close encounter spotted by a U.S. Air Force pilot off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. Oh my God. There's a, a, a new insider who's just come forward and he's been saying that he was told that the Tic Tac UFOs were these hybrid craft that were capable of traveling through the ocean at uh, 500 miles an hour and in the air at 24,000 miles an hour and escaping Earth's velocity if they needed to. And that these were craft that were actually being made uh, for the US Air Force. So these were Air Force secret space program vehicles being produced at this secretive facility in Palmdale, California called Plant 42, which has long been known to be a, a major production site for highly classified craft that the Air Force has been having various contractors work on and assemble for them. Lockheed Martin Skunk Works actually relocated from Burbank, California to this facility, Plant 42, up in Palmdale. So Plant 42 is where you actually have these Tic Tac craft actually being produced for the US Air Force. Well, that was one of the most amazing things to us, or at least to me, was that these objects would be out there all day uh, and the speeds that they're exhibiting as well as the flight characteristics. Uh, there's no platform or really an energy source that I'm aware of that could allow something to stay in the air uh, as long as these objects were. According to this whistleblower, he's being encouraged to come forward to, to let the public know that these craft are secret Air Force craft. Space. going to be a lot of things happening in space. Because space is the world's newest warfighting domain. Amid grave threats to our national security, American superiority in space is absolutely vital. Which has just been set up early 2020. Uh, space Force has had its logo approved. It has its new commander. It's got its uh, chief enlisted officer approved. And they're, and they're working out the details of uh, personnel requirements, uniforms, and so forth. So that's all being set up. Cape Canaveral Air Force Station will soon officially get a new name. It will be called Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Patrick Air Force Base will also get the new Space Force moniker. It's to reflect the new Space Force branch of the military. So that's all being set up. But in the meantime, we have the craft, some of the craft, like these Tic Tac craft, which are about 46 feet long, that are, that are, in, that are shaped like a Tic Tac, so they're cylindrical, that these are going to be one of the vehicles that are eventually going to be released. And basically the Air Force or Space Force is going to make it known that this is part of their apparatus or part of their arsenal for outer space operations. Everybody's asking the biggest question in the world. Are we alone? That is strange. That is really weird. Like... Do we really need the government to tell us? That's... I've never seen that. Go ahead, I don't think that. Go ahead, go ahead. For thousands of years, and to present day, there's evidence of extraterrestrial craft that we don't know of. Uh, so it's like 30 seconds ago. There's seven one pop off negative. It's a UFO. Yeah. It's murder tonight. They're not only Navy pilots that witness the phenomenon. Regular people, including NASA themselves, capture anomalies that can't be explained.
Through the eyewitness testimony and video evidence to back it up, it proves that there's something bizarre happening in the skies. Sober military pilots saying something that we can't explain is happening. That is correct. You're talking about individuals who have very high security clearances. They are trained observers. NASA themselves capture things in space with the ISS that they still can't explain to this day. We zero up towards about 12,000 feet and then accelerate in less than two seconds and disappear is something I had never seen in my life. There is a difference between UFO technology from another world and reverse engineered technology that a government faction uses to keep secrets from the military, such as the Navy. The whole point of the government military system is to hold the secret, as they did with the stealth bomber for 40 years. Is this the new technology that they're about to reveal to the public? The people who would be, say, briefing the president or the Senator Marco Rubio who made the comment, this, you know, we don't know what these are, but we do want to know what they are. But the people who are surrounding that level of, of our politicians and government are not told the full story. And that's why our group is trying to correct that. We're trying to create a different dynamic and provide accurate information and also analysis. Why is it secret? Who's keeping it secret? Where is it kept secret? The question becomes, who is piloting these secret spacecraft? Could they be aliens from another world? Or could they be humans piloting these exotic craft? We must be forward-looking in our research and development to anticipate and achieve the unimagined weapons of the future. showcases technology that we've had two decades ago. Notice the characteristics of this flying machine. It can move left to right. It can turn on a dime. Imagine the capabilities in today's world. The technology in this declassified video has yet to be implemented to the world, or has it? Could this be what the Navy pilots are witnessing? So these tic-tac-shaped craft, uh, they're able to move really quickly through the water using a principle called uh, supercavitation. So that's basically where you actually have like a bubble uh, preventing water molecules from hitting the craft, creating friction and slowing it down. So because of supercavitation, the craft is able to travel through the water at up to 500 miles an hour. So this is pretty much identical to a patent that was released by the US Navy uh, around 2018, where it talks about how this hybrid aerospace underwater craft is able to basically generate an electromagnetic field uh, in a cavity around the craft's hull. So it's double hulled and so we, between the outer hull and the inner hull you have a cavity and in there you have microwaves bouncing around and that generates a quantum vacuum around the craft. So all water molecules and if you're in the air, air molecules or if you're in space, plasma and so forth are all moved out of the way. So this enables the craft to move incredibly fast through the water, through the atmosphere, and in the space. So this is why this, uh, this Navy patent is called a hybrid aerospace underwater craft. And this is precisely what the Tic Tac craft was doing, that the Navy pilots that recorded this craft on their videos, which has been released, um, and basically people are trying to work out, you know, is this extraterrestrial or what? Well, now we know because of this new insider that these craft are actually Air Force secret spacecraft that have been built over at Palmdale, California. They're ma manned craft and they're able to achieve these tremendous velocities because of this supercavitation principle that's generated by a quantum vacuum 
around the craft in terms of the direction it's moving at. It's probably one part of the military not telling the other part, other part of the military what they're up to for a good reason. I did have one very brief meeting on it, but people are saying they're seeing UFOs. Do I believe it? Not particularly. Some people think that yes, they travel between Mach 5 and Mach 20, and maybe, just maybe, they could be secret weapons devised by the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans. Well, you know, what, what the president formed a couple of years ago, known as the Space Force, is just an acknowledgement of operations that have already existed for decades that have to do with uh, reconnaissance in space and putting assets in space, for example, on some of our satellites, uh, usually run by the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO, we have uh, weapon systems that can target objects. And so we do have assets like that. Uh, I think what the president has done with acknowledging that is somebody has manipulated this issue in a false way to get him to respond as if there is a threat from outer space which does not exist. And remember, these are things that happen all the time. We went into the Iraq war based on false manufactured evidence that was completely made up about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction. And, um, you know, a trillion dollars, two trillion dollars later and hundreds of thousands of people dead later, um, it's been well proven that that was all false information designed to support the military intelligence complex, the big contractors. So um, unfortunately, I think the president has got, been getting some poor advice on this. We're trying to uh, fix that situation with information we're trying to provide, or are providing. But ultimately, the bureaucracy surrounding the president can, as I mentioned earlier, can manipulate him into some direction. And so the narrative that's being launched, which is a false narrative, is that we're not alone and that those civilizations are a threat. And it's completely made up. Werner von Braun, who invented the uh, rocket for Adolf Hitler, the V2 rocket, stated on his deathbed that this is what we would eventually do, is hoax an alien threat that could unite the world and, uh, and consolidate power around some sort of off-world threat, which is completely false. The whole aspect of the Space Force announced by President Donald Trump in recent times he's been stated to say that maybe they want them to see what they're seeing in regards to this advanced technology. The Navy says it still doesn't know what the objects are and officials aren't speculating. A Navy spokesman simply confirming to CNN the objects seen in the various clips are unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs. Just recently, in early March 2020, a video has surfaced of a joint mission between the U.S. and Navy performing jet military exercises and some anomalous object is spotted in the background. This could be the new U.S. Space Force technology being revealed, slowly put out as a small disclosure. I think as the time goes on, more and more whistleblowers from the secret space program will come forward and reveal the technology that needs to be shared with the world. One of the key takeaways I'd have is that the, um, you know, the military and others are taking this issue seriously, which I think in previous generations may not have been the case. As president, the access to all the information right. in, in the world, all the mysteries out there. And I was just struck in the last couple of weeks, we're reading more and more reports of Navy pilots seeing lots and lots of UFOs. Have you been briefed yeah, on that? What do you I make have, of it? I have. I, I think it's probably, uh, I want them to think whatever they think. I've seen and I've read and I've heard, and I did have one very brief meeting on it, but people are saying they're seeing UFOs. So Plant 42 is a classified Air Force facility that was built from 1935 to 1956. Different contractors have been working with the Air Force to produce their most classified aircraft at this Plant 42 in Palmdale, California. 
So you've had corporations like Northrop Grumman, uh, Lockheed Martin and several other corporations that jointly operate the Plant 42 facility up there. And it's a huge facility, we're talking about several million square feet, divided amongst these major contractors who are all working on classified programs on behalf of the Air Force and also NASA. NASA also operates uh, facilities out of this uh, Palmdale uh, Plan 42. So what we have at Plan 42 is a top secret facility where some of the alien spacecraft that have been recovered since the 1947 Roswell crash, that these have been secretly studied and the reverse engineering has been occurring at, at Palmdale so that way the Air Force is able to have some prototypes developed of various differently shaped craft that are based on these flying saucers or these flying triangles or whatever alien craft that they've been able to retrieve that they are being secretly studied and reverse engineered there at Plant 42. So what we now have flying as part of the Air Force's secret space program, a craft that have been reverse engineered from alien technologies that have been taken to facilities like Plant 42 or Area 51 or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio and studied and then the major contractors like Lockheed and Northrop Grumman build prototypes for the Air Force that are then flown out of Palmdale. So in the case of this tic-tac shaped craft that was sighted in 2004 and captured on video, its size makes it something that can be easily transported on a flatbed truck out of uh, Plant 42 to wherever the Air Force wants it taken. So typically it, these might be taken to facilities like Edwards Air Force Base, whereas at Area 51 in Nevada, what you have there is a place where some of the older or some of the original extraterrestrial craft were first taken and studied. And so Area 51 is more like a museum where scientists or congressmen or anyone that wants to be kind of read in or is going to be read into this kind of advanced alien technology sees the craft and studies it. That are moving in ways that appear to violate physics, that are flying very differently from any aircraft ever observed, and way faster than any plane that we know any foreign country has. What is this? Uh, only a select number of our congressmen are chosen to actually be given a tour of these facilities. And they choose the congressman very, very carefully. They always choose someone who they know after they're read in, which means that they're basically given the classified files, that they'll read those files and they'll keep a secret and they, they're not going to do anything to divulge those national security secrets that they learn. So I know one of these congressmen was Senator Claiborne Pell. And so he was read in um, in the 80s and so he was given tours of these facilities like Area 51, uh, Plant 42 over at Palmdale and shot, given a complete tour because he could keep a secret. And this is the way in which the secrecy system operates because uh, as long as uh, those that run these projects consult with Congress or brief select congressmen who maybe run various important committees like uh, Senator Claiborne Pell, you know, he ran some important committees um, out of the Senate. When these senators or congressmen are read in, uh, that means that the secrecy system is able to justify itself. It has a certain amount of legitimacy. And so this is a system that has taken many, many decades to set up to maintain the secrecy so that that way you don't have people within the Navy or within the Air Force that might object to the secrecy and leak the information. It should have been the biggest bombshell story in the whole world. It was eight months before the Pearl Harbor attack and seven years before the Roswell UFO crash. It was late April of 1941. In Cape Girardeau, Missouri, my hometown, back then it was about 20,000 citizens on the banks of the Mississippi River. It was around nine o'clock one night when a Reverend William G. Huffman in Cape Girardeau, a very fine, respected Christian minister and father and soon to be grandfather, received a phone call and left his home on North Main Street. He went out to be picked up in his car outside the house and took off and came back a few hours later. When he came home, 
He was shaken and pale and told his family, I'm going to tell you this story just once and never speak of it again. What he told his family is the following narrative. Someone from the police department or affiliated with the Cape Girardeau Police Department came by and picked him up and took him out to a airplane crash outside of town. Everyone thought an airplane had gone down. That's what was called in that evening to the Cape Girardeau Fire and Police Department. When he got there, Reverend Huffman and another man arrived at the scene and there was a fire and there was a craft down, an aerial craft, but it was circular, not a cylindrical airplane at all. There were no human victims anywhere, but there were three bodies stretched out in a field, uh, side by side, in the grass, uh, face up. They were small and gray and very wrinkly crinkly as if they had flight suits or skin that melded together and could not withstand our oxygen rich atmosphere. So he did what he came for, said prayers over the first and second dead bodies of these gray creatures, which people at the time called little men from outer space. They didn't use the term I'm told, extraterrestrial, alien, UFO, they just called it a little spaceship and little men. So Reverend Huffman said some prayers uh, over the third body when he noticed it was breathing. Its chest was going up and down, just barely, but it was still alive. As he was saying his prayers, two local men picked up one of the other two dead bodies and propped him up under the arms and stretched his long arms out and were posing for a photograph. There was a newspaper man there who had a big news graphic camera, but he didn't use that. He pulled out a small brownie box camera from his pocket and snapped the picture, and then he put it back in his pocket. Reverend Huffman looked down and noticed that the creature on the ground that he was saying prayers for expired. It went limp and lifeless. At one point, he walked over to this round craft that was cracked open with debris, metallic shards all around this field, which had been on fire. The fire department was trying to put out the blaze. And he got a good look inside the craft that was laying there in the grass. Uh, he said there were a couple of tiny little seats and a kind of instrument panel with gauges and dials and above it, uh, a silver circular band around the top interior that seemed to have strange symbols on it, almost as if hieroglyphics that he could not make out. Around this time, some visitors arrived and they moved in and surrounded the site. It was the United States Army. They asked everyone to hand over every piece of evidence, all of the film and camera photos, all of the notes, all of the debris to get away from the craft and the bodies and swear that they would never speak of this incident again. This never happened, they were told. It's a matter of national security. And many in the crowd of gathered farmers and local first responders, including the county sheriff's department, the police department, an FBI agent, and reporters, lived up to that promise. The recent releases in the New York Times, CNN, elsewhere, including the recent one from uh, aerospace contractor uh, Davis, he uh, stated on the record that there were materiel. The New York Times reporting that a secretive Pentagon unit tasked with investigating UFO sightings is quite likely releasing some of its findings soon, and those findings could be stunning. Not from this planet, all the world. But apparently, just recovered are off-world vehicles not made on this Earth. That's a direct quote. We're not exactly sure what they mean by that. Now, that's a true statement. Uh, and it did make its way into the mainstream media. The uh, retraction of it was probably something that was forced by people who felt it was moving too quickly. Some people say that there are some public corporations that have materials that we should look at. Now, I wanted to make sure that that was valid or not valid. So remember, if it's in the mainstream media, 
They will release a little bit of information, but what's happening is that it has a spin attached to it of a national security threat. The other spin is, we don't know what these are. Well, let me correct this on, on the record. I have a man on my team um, who was the senior scientist for the Naval Research Labs, Rick Foch. And a very long time ago, he was in the vault where all the top secret documents are stored. And he saw the document where we had mastered gravity control, where we could create our own UFOs in October 1954. So when people are trotted out by, there's a group called TTSA, To the Stars Academy with Tom DeLong. That's also a counterintelligence operation. Tom doesn't know that. I mean, I knew him very when he was young and, you know, the Blink-22 group. But that information is, that, that whole effort is chock full of people who are being told to tell the people a very limited amount of information. And, and then add to it the counterintelligence spin that it's a threat, and then add to it that we don't really know what these are or where they come from. And the, the truth is, my archive, which now I have 980 top secret military intelligence aerospace people in my team, it's quite provable now that we do know that some of these objects are extraterrestrial and some are made by us that people are seeing. We have uh, things flying over our military bases and places where we're conducting military exercises and we don't know what it is and it isn't ours. So that's a legitimate question to ask. I would say that, um, uh, frankly, that if it's something of outside, outside this planet, that might actually be better than the fact that we've seen some technological leap on behalf of the Chinese or the Russians or some other adversary. We have been experimenting with these technologies since the 40s and 50s, but had mastered the basic science for lift and movement in strange ways without a rocket or a jet engine in the 50s. So a lot of people are being deceived on this quite deliberately because I think the bigger secret than the fact that we're not alone in the universe is that we have highly classified projects that have technologies that would make your hair curl that are so advanced. But the bottom line is if there are things flying over your military bases and you don't know what they are because they're not yours and they exhibit potentially technologies that you don't have at your own disposal, that to me is a national security risk and one that we should be looking into. And the reason that's kept secret is that if that information comes out and is acknowledged, then the next step is every scientist in the world and technology company in the world is going to say, how are they operating? And when they ask that question, it'll be answered. We have the answers. And it's the end of oil, gas, coal, public utilities, internal combustion engines, jets, rockets, all of it's obsolete. So you're talking more than a thousand trillion dollars.
U.S. Navy has finally acknowledged that videos appearing to show UFOs flying through the air are real. They don't call them UFOs, they call them unidentified aerial phenomena. The UFO reports were first investigated by a secret $22 million program, part of the Defense Department budget, that investigated reports of UFOs. If you are read in, you're given this classified information, you are expected to maintain secrecy. You're expected to go along with whatever the cover story is for those special access programs. And if you don't go along with the cover story, uh, then you can be prosecuted. So you, you for example, um, you have to deny if you're working for the Air Force or you're a congressman, if someone asks you about a particular program that you know about that involves some of these reverse engineered craft that are being built at Plan 42, you've got to deny its existence. And you've got to go along with what, whatever the cover story is, otherwise you can be prosecuted. So this has been a very effective system that's been developed over decades. Recently, a NASA scientist has debunked recent footage from the ISS, claiming it to be obsolete instrumental equipment to be sent down to Earth to burn in its atmosphere. Notice, as this object leaves Earth, it fires a plasmic green thrust. This is obvious evidence of the International Space Station being visited by something from another world or something from a dark project. If an event civilization could travel from galaxy to galaxy, they would be traveling much faster than the speed of light, entering different dimensions. Could these beings be time travelers jumping from dimension to another, showing itself by the International Space Station? December 8, 2018, a mysterious craft approaches the Cargo X space station as it rendezvous with the International Space Station. What is this exotic craft? As you can clearly see, the Cargo X fires its thrusters and it highlights whatever this triangular craft is. Why is NASA trying to cover up these anomalous objects that surround Earth and the International Space Station? What is their agenda? We now have a broadly based and efficient defensive strength. But unless we act wisely and promptly, we could lose that capacity to deter attack or defend ourselves. Dr. Salas had a question on whether or not we could take alien technology, do reverse engineering, and incorporate it in today's modern military warfare aircrafts such as, could we build the uh, Tic Tac? Do we have the ability to do that? My, my answer to that would be, I believe, yes. Uh, ben Rich, Kelly Johnson, uh, others have indicated that we have taken technology uh, from various sources, modified it to, you know, to meet our needs. We have the technology to send E.T. home. He said that in a, in a uh, speech at UCLA shortly after he retired in the mid-90s. If we have the ability to take E.T. home, that means we have the ability to go, go to the stars. And to quote Bob, Bob Lazar, uh, he, you know, he's sort of jumping with joy right now, you know, thinking that the stuff that he worked on for a short time at S4 is going to is going to come to uh, fruition. It, the world is going to see what he's you know, what he was up to. You know whether or not can we build a craft that can be flying at 3,000 miles an hour and take a 90 degree turn? That technology exists today, not in a manned uh, system, but in an unmanned system. You know you question about uh, alien technology. It was it was rumored that it took. DuPont 15 years to reverse engineer Kevlar 
it, nothing about it is found naturally in, in uh, nature. You had it, it, it was a compound of a, num a number of different components, and it's a very, very special fabric that allegedly came out of the crash site at Roswell. Same with integrated circuits. I mean, there, in 1947, we were still dealing with vacuum tubes. I can remember Dick Tracy, and you're looking at your watch, and, and you know, there's a radio in there, and, and even, even a, and you could actually talk to somebody, and then later on, they even had a little TV screen. How absurd with that? How could that ever happen? Well, if you have an Apple Watch, it, take, it, it checks your EKG. Where did all that technology come from? Did it, did it come from the crash site at, at uh, Roswell? Did it come from S4, where Bob Lazar was doing research, you know, reverse engineering on the propulsion system for, the, for alien spacecraft? I don't know. Visible entities saying the government has told us that we have craft made, not made of this earth. The, the United States Army, today it's the Navy, it's in control of all the super, super secret stuff. And they doled it out to various companies and allowed them to, you know, to patent the you know, patent it if they could figure out how to how to work it. And they did. And that technology is you know, that te technology is what we enjoy today. Well, what what are called tic, the Tic Tac that was reported all over the media in the last couple of years has been confirmed. Uh, honestly, without more data, it's hard to say what that was. Um, it could have been uh, an experimental object from Lockheed, Martin Skunk Works, or some other contractor. Uh, it's technically possible it was ET, I doubt it, because the extraterrestrial objects are actually also trans-dimensional. I would say is that I'm agnostic about where that footage came from. It, you know, is it because it would be very easy to set up some, an event like that, and our the average jet pilot, even if he's a top gun guy in the Navy or Air Force, so they encounter that and they don't know if they've encountered something from another planet or something that's been launched out of Palmdale or Edwards Air Force Base that's a highly classified, man-made, uh, anti-gravity, electromagnetic gravitic type object. Um, and so without more information, it's hard to say what that object was. I think the intention of the release of the information was so that they could sh get the, the media to start covering this. But if you look at all the news stories, there's a not so subtle messaging that it's a national security threat. That's what keeps getting used by Senator uh, Rubio uh, and by the media and the New York Times and CNN. So that narrative is the purpose of the release. The, the, the release of that footage in and of itself is really not significant. We have in our archives, much better photos and videos of ET craft and UFOs, much better. I think it was because it was something that had uh, the imprimatur of the Pentagon on it, and they could attach this false narrative to it. Oh yeah, it's hitting something. It's searching for something out there. Why? Look, it's holding, it's just stalled out there. Yeah, they're staying in one spot here. Yeah, the triangle. Take a look, guys. There is some wild looking crap in the skies. Holy. Yes. Gonna put my hat on backwards. I don't know what's going on. I hope these are in. There's some weird lights in the sky. Russia, China, and the U.S. are all locked in this race to develop these advanced technologies. 
Each one has its own resources in terms of whatever extraterrestrial hardware they've been able to recover and their scientists are reverse engineering these and trying to apply it to whatever aerospace vehicles they're secretly developing. So China is really the major competitor to the US and the big danger here is that with China, because the Chinese economy is much larger than Russia's and China's economy by 2030 will surpass the US. And so at that point, that's when China's military assets are going to be basically able to dictate a lot of our policies on Earth and, and in space. Quantum computing is, is the key area where China's advances in terms of artificial intelligence are going to be really dominant. Because China has a vast population, it's rolling out things like voice recognition, facial recognition, it's using a lot of drones, it's uh, moving fast ahead in terms of like driverless cars. So it's developing AI much more quickly and so its quantum computing capacities are increasing rapidly. This is one of the things that uh, is really worrying a, a lot of military analysts, like how do you deal with uh, China moving so fast ahead in terms of AI, quantum computing, and, and the US isn't really putting as much resources into that, and lacks the kind of um, the, the, the human infrastructure, the human capital to develop artificial intelligence uh, to the extent that China is. Through abduction accounts, people have heard messages not to mess with technology too much. And now the advent of AI and quantum computing might go against what the aliens don't want us to do. The top minds of today have warned us about AI. Elon Musk. Digital superintelligence. An AI that is vastly smarter than any human on Earth and ultimately smarter than all humans on Earth combined. And the late Stephen Hawking. Are we prepared for AI? Or are we on the cusp of our own annihilation? The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have have proved very useful. But I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Recently, Google announced quantum supremacy. The tech giant says its quantum processor was able to perform a complex mathematical calculation. They asked the most advanced computer we have now in their new quantum computer a mathematical algorithm question. It's going to take the most advanced computer we have today 10,000 years to answer the question. The new quantum computer has answered it in less than two minutes. The implications behind this advanced technology and the information we'll learn from it can change the world forever. If you could just imagine the Jetsons. It may be just around the corner. Is there anti-gravity, free energy? Well, I think the videos prove it. Is there a secret cover-up? by the masters that play our social media. When looking for the answer to the big question, people have to do their own research, read between the lines and understand the powers that be don't want us to know the answer to the big question. If there's a time for disclosure, 2020 will be the year when the world knows that there's something going on in our skies and the answers will be told to the masses. Well, I think, you know, the whole issue about AI quantum computing in and of itself, uh, it's like anything. Any technology can be used for good or for ill. It's, it's who wields it. So, you know, I'm an emergency doctor. I've seen knives be used to put butter on your bread or to cut someone's throat. So I use that analogy for any of these technologies. In and of themselves, technologies are essentially neutral. It's the consciousness and spiritual awareness, or lack thereof, of those who control it and wield it. And I think whether it's extraterrestrial technology that's been studied or AI, all of it has to have an ethical approach. And that's why it needs to have great transparency and people who are very conscious of uh, monitoring how that goes forward. The problem is, is that the public 
has to be informed and involved. Because once you get oligarchs and people of enormous power and wealth controlling it, then you are in trouble. So I think this is the, the answer is it has to be democratized and it has to be transparent. I think extraterrestrials are watching our planet in terms of how we deal with these problems in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and whether we go down the track of automating uh, all our most advanced technologies with artificial intelligence because if we do then we become a threat to them because as far as I understand it many of the extraterrestrial races are very careful about artificial intelligence because there's a danger because with artificial intelligence once you kind of reach the singularity point an artificial intelligence basically is able to start uh, building more intelligent uh, AI machines themselves they don't need humans to do that anymore then they don't need us and and this is something that has been a big problem um, out there according to insiders contactees who have been communicating with extraterrestrials that once you reach that singularity point AI becomes a threat so how are we going to deal with that are we going to allow artificial intelligence to start self-replicating once it becomes so advanced and it starts to build automated uh, craft or automated synthetic beings itself, thereby threatening us. And extraterrestrials are wanting to see which direction we go because they had to navigate that, that kind of uh, danger themselves. We are rapidly headed towards digital superintelligence that far exceeds any human. I think it's very obvious. So the future is really exciting because Space Force has been created expressly with the purpose of releasing some of these advanced technologies that the Air Force has developed and put out in the space. And so with Space Force, it's now been set up and over the next 12 months, you're going to have personnel being shifted in from various military services, from the Air Force, from the Navy, from the Army. And then they're going to be starting to release some of the advanced technology. We're talking flying rectangles, flying triangles, flying saucer shaped craft, and even these tic tac shaped craft. And then you've got all of the kind of advanced medical uh, technologies that have been developed. So all this stuff is going to come out into the, the white world. It's going to come out of this very dark, nebulous world of highly classified programs into this kind of white world where the technology is revealed and the public is going to go, wow, we didn't know we had this stuff. It's going to be made to look as though all of this is brand new technology that's just been developed for the use of Space Force, but in fact, this technology has been around for decades and was secretly being used by the Air Force. And this is how they wanted to disclose it to the general public. I think the AI technology is, is less of a uh, issue for the next 10 years than the release of the basic operating system, let's call it, of zero point energy and anti-gravity. For this simple reason is, so what if you have a supercomputer or AI, if the way you're running that machine in your server farm is off a fossil fuel grid that's destroying the biosphere? So the, the, you know, all that stuff is interesting and people can get all involved with it, but let me introduce a concept from my career as an emergency trauma guy. You triage things. So <laughs> I would say that that's a concern if it's used improperly, but nowhere near as big a concern that we are imploding the biosphere and that still half the world's population is in extreme poverty. So I think people need to keep their eye on the priorities uh, and, and those are the big ones. So the problem with the conspiracy theories and people dealing with UFOs in general, they actually don't understand what unacknowledged special access projects are, which is what I keep coming back to, that's the proper concept. And those are ones that do have people involved who, to get into them, you have to psychologically be willing to do criminal and illegal activities, up to and including treason. Which, when you're lying to the president, or denying the president information, the Congress information, that is treason, it is illegal. Now, that's one of the reasons why all, the, all my uh, whistleblowers that I have on my team, I've told them they're scared to death initially. I said, no, the project you were in is illegally run. Therefore, they can't prosecute you for violating the National Security Act. And we have declared that, sent documents to the government stating this and explaining it, which is why they eventually do come forward. However, the 
uh, projects that are dealing with this issue have, I would say, three big agendas. One is they want to keep this issue secret until they can use it as a foil to unite the world around an alien threat that's completely fake. This is exactly what Werner von Braun stated. The other is that their projects themselves are being run so illegally that the history of them, going back to when Eisenhower was betrayed and left out of them in the late Eisenhower years, would be such a scandal. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable scandal uh, of corruption. But people have gotten trillions and trillions of dollars in the year, over the years, in contracting money. Um, I, mean, I mean, literally trillions, to work on this issue off the books. And then the, the other big issue is, you know, people call a cell phone a disruptive technology. It isn't. Or YouTube or whatever. Those are, or Amazon. None of these things are of any consequence. You know, the things that are of great consequence, and when you start talking about thousands of trillions of dollars in assets that have to do with how the entire world is running. So think, think about this. It's not just geopolitical power, um, theoretically, it's actual physical power. So the way you're running your house and car on a central electric grid, or even an electric car where you plug it in, you're plugging it into a grid that is metered. These technologies involve really advanced physics, high-voltage systems that pull energy out of the space around us. It means there would be zero cost for energy, zero pollution, and it would literally be free. Now, what does that mean? It means that all the commodities, assets, infrastructure... That And so that's why the public is very vulnerable. They go, where do we get good information? So that's you know, why I left my medical career to start a project to do that. But um, it's very difficult because obviously we're the underdogs. <laughs> we're the renegades, I guess. Um, but 
the, these technologies are a central part, not the only one reason. It has to do with some other agendas as well. Um, and some of them are pretty bizarre. Like I met with one member of the committee that deals with the secrecy who wanted to be able to hoax and has been involved with hoaxing abductions and mutilations so that the public would hate the aliens enough to go to an interplanetary war, and I'm quoting now, so Christ would return. No, I, I mean, this is, I know it's a little batshit crazy, excuse my language, but I mean, I, this is a member of a royal family in Europe, and I'm listening to this going, you know, this is worrisome, because you have people of enormous power and wealth who have a strange agenda that's a little bit whacked out, to be honest with you, but they have enormous power and they have enormous power over the media and the public and what's released. It's probably time to stop calling people who believe in UFOs crackpots. After the recent revelation that there's actually a Pentagon task force looking into them, one astrophysicist who has worked for the Pentagon's UFO program since 2007 told the New York Times that he gave a classified briefing to a Defense Department agency about retrievals from, quote, off-world vehicles not made on this earth. You know, Bob, do you think Bob would be willing to make a statement? Yeah, about the report. And, uh, and that, that, we, you know, that we, would, we would record. Uh, it could be a brief statement saying, hallelujah, I'm, you know, I'm finally vindicated. Russia didn't work, uh, impeachment didn't work, COVID didn't work, riots didn't work. We need an alien invasion. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my that's my that's my my, my theory on why you know, that was released. But uh, yeah, it's possible. I think Trump just needed something to distract everybody. Else, so. We know that the technologies are, already exist that would give us a new civilization with no pollution and also no surface roads. The problem with the ones that are airborne is that those are also can be repurposed as a uh, missile or uh, something that could cross, go from place A to B and deliver a weapon. So what we've been advising, I've been advising the CIA director for Bill Clinton and others, is that the technologies related to energy generation should come out first so that we would have clean energy, no pollution, factories, cars, everything. The step of bringing out, you know, where everyone would have an individual vehicle that would be so-called anti-gravity and lift and go over the road without any roads, uh, which is, we already have that technology. We will be traveling that way, not in the not too distant future, I believe. But that has to be brought out, understanding that the international security situation has to be attended to very carefully because those can be a weapon delivery system. So I, I sort of separate the, the technology release in, in sort of two phases. One would stabilize the biosphere, heal the planet, fix Gaia, um, eliminate poverty around the world, and these other technologies that would allow us to go from here to Tokyo in four or five minutes with one of these objects that, that we understand how they operate. I have equations of how those work. I have it down. I mean, my team has people on it who've worked on building them. Those really have to be looked at because you could have some unstable dictator or a terrorist somewhere who could take one of those objects once it was widely known how to do it and send a weapon over into the middle of New York City or whatever. So I, I'm not cavalier about the implications of this. And I'll never forget being, I was on, uh, at, the, at the JY Ranch in the Tetons, the Rockefeller Ranch, 
one of the members of the Rockefeller family, David Rockefeller, is part of this committee keeping this secret, but the philosopher king of the family, Lawrence, it really wanted all this out. So he hosted us at the Rockefeller Ranch and then later the Clintons there to receive a briefing. And one night I was, I was out on the, 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 the deck of, of this place, on the porch, and uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, who was in his 80s, came up to me and he said, you know, we really need this to come out. And I said, yes, so what are you gonna do? You're a Rockefeller, you're old and you're rich. I'm a young doctor. And he says, oh no, my family's already jumping up and down on me for even having this meeting. And then he said, look, the implications of this knowledge and technology coming, coming out, are, those implications are so vast and so profound, no aspect of life on earth would be unaffected. I said, yes, Lawrence, that's why it's secret. But it's also, the secrecy is killing the planet. It's impoverishing half the world's population, all of which is fixable, by the way. So I tell people the big, the message of great hope here is, is that if the public gets behind the release of this in the correct way for peace on earth and peace in space, universal peace, then we can have a civilization that would be almost like a paradise here. I mean, imagine and within a generation, um, by the time my you know, grandkids are half my age, we could have a, a civilization where there'd be no poverty or pollution and full sustainability and go into space peacefully. But if we don't get this right, we're headed for a terminal a extinction level event. So that is how grave the stakes are. And that's why my project, I'm very dedicated to bringing this information out as fully as we can to the public, because I think that Washington and the big corporate political world is so beholden to special interest and also just lack the vision and courage up until now. I mean, things can change. I hope they do. But uh, my concern is that what we're going to see are disclosures on this subject like we've been seeing that are attached to trying to unite the public over a common off-world alien enemy, which is completely false. I mean, th those civilizations are so advanced that they have absolutely no intention of being hostile. But they're concerned, the reason they're here, is they're concerned about our hostility. We're the problem. People wanna go, well, you know where the problem is? Go get a mirror and look in it. It's how humans are behaving on this planet. And also, we're going into space. It is uh, President Trump's belief that the United States must remain as dominant in space as we are on land, and see in the air. And your charge is to see to that mission with the United States Space Force, to defend this nation and to defend our ideals. So we have to get the public involved in only bringing out the technology safely, the information within a context of truth and peacefulness, but we also need to have people making contact with these civilizations uh, directly who are not warmongers and war profiteers, for lack of a better word. The public doesn't understand the UFO issue, and we have documents that state this quite clearly, is the most classified issue in the history of the United States, exceeding even the development of the hydrogen bomb. And we have this in those words in a, in a declassified top secret document. Therefore, you know, the president, to the extent that he's provided any information, would also be told, but you can't talk about this with anyone public, da, da, da. I think the current president is inclined to sort of push the envelope on it. Are you going to commit more resources to, to exploring uh, UFOs and open the documents uh, to the public? Well, I'll do whatever you uh, ask me to do, including total transparency. And I got to tell you, there's probably some pretty good transparency needed there. There's no doubt about that. I can tell you that there's not a president that's been in, in the Oval Office that where this isn't pretty much the first thing they asked about. Um, we discussed a lot of different situations, some wonderful and some difficulties. We explained some of the difficulties, some of the the high flying assets, and some of the some of the really great things that have been achieved. Donald Trump and the people who are in his inner circle, and I know a number of them, and so we know there's strong interest. 
My concern is that, again, the president is being manipulated sort of the way Ronald Reagan was with Star Wars, the SDI initiative, where they were putting weapons to target objects in space. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. The way they got Ronald Reagan to fund that, and I know the colonel, Colonel Holman, who went and did the briefing, was to present uh, false information showing there was a threat from outer space. And uh, unfortunately, let's face it, Ronald Reagan was an actor, Donald Trump, is a businessman, real estate developer. These are not people who came up through very covert programs in the intelligence or Pentagon or large corporate uh, contractors like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Skunk Works. Those, are, that's where the action is. And so uh, again, they're going to, to tell the public to the extent they know anything, uh, very little because they were warned not to. And I want to I want to share a story. It's, it's it's apocryphal, perhaps, but back when President Clinton was president, so I was asked to brief his CIA director on this problem. Uh, I found out that they had been denied access to the projects dealing with UFOs, and I didn't believe it. I thought this has got to be just false information. So. What happened is that when I went to the briefing with the CIA director, it was very clear that he, in fact, had not been able to get information, even though he was the director of the CIA. He said that if the president did what I was recommending, which was to terminate the secrecy, bring the information out, but also bring out the technologies that would get us off oil, because that's how those UFOs are moving. Then, you know, if he did it, and, and this is one of his best friends, looked me right in the eyes and said, we're convinced he will end up like Jack Kennedy. I thought he was joking. I burst out laughing because it's such a, it's cliche, right? Um, and he said, no, we're not kidding. So I said, well, then we are in real trouble. So I think that there, you know, people have to understand there's a, a click a sort of a cabal of these unacknowledged special access projects, both in the United States and around the world. It's a transnational group. So the structure of it is not just US, but it sort of goes beneath the radar of most geopolitical boundaries. And that group, um, you know, they're very powerful. And, you know, they've not been real happy with what we're doing, but that's all right. They, they understand that for the most part, with enough inducements or threats, they can get their way, and they normally do. George W. Bush, who we did provide briefing to, and, and Andy Card as chief of staff, we directly gave a briefing to. But Bush wasn't that interested, and the guy running these kind of covert programs was Vice President Cheney. And he was on the committee dealing with the secrecy. We know this. And then, of course, we had President Obama, uh, John Podesta, who ran Hillary Clinton's campaign uh, and had been chief of staff for Bill Clinton, we had provided a briefing for Obama through uh, John Podesta. The problem is, is that they're to, in that situation also, they were not providing information to Obama. Um, and now we have Trump. So my history with Trump is that as soon as he got nominated, a member of one of his delegates, who I know for the Republican National Committee asked me to put a briefing together and that was put into his hands. Now, subsequent to that, there were senior disinformation agents who were put into the Trump campaign embedded as trusted national security advisors, which were put in place to neutralize the information we were giving them and sort of debunk it. That's how it works. So now we're at this point where Everything's in dynamic flux. We'll see what happens in the next year to three or four years. Do you feel threatened or intimidated in regards to the information you're sharing with us? I, you know, look, I've been doing this for 30 years. 
and I've been briefing people at the level of the CIA director, members of the Senate Intelligence Com Committee since I was a fairly young doctor. So I don't, at this stage, I, I'm accustomed to the social opprobrium and condemnation and all the stuff and the threats. And I mean, you have to remember when in 1992, the head of Army Intelligence offered me personally two billion dollars if I would be quiet and not talk about this stuff. And I refused. I said, no, I'm not going to be corrupted that way. And I said, I don't need your money, frankly. I don't want it. But then the threats really came in. And between 1995 and 98, I mean, there were three people on my team assassinated, and I was almost killed. So that was a very dangerous time. At this point, we have really good systems in place, frankly, I won't go into it. And the pressure I feel, personally, is that we're running out of time. Because it's a little bit the concept of V2, Victor 2, when you're going down a runway with a plane, uh, Victor 2, V2, is when you either have to go wheels up or shut the engines down because you're going to run out of runway. Our civilization is at the end of the runway of this particular era. And if we're going to launch into another era, it has to be an era of not only world peace, but universal peace in space and these technologies coming out and living together in a civilized way. So we can only run out the clock so long. And remember, we've had a hundred years since Nikola Tesla where we could have had a lot of these technologies out, at least the ones for generating energy. And we are destroying the biosphere for no good reason. So what I feel the pressure on is not on me personally. I mean, whether I live or die, I mean, we were all die at some point. I don't, you know, I accept that, the risk I'm taking. What worries me is that the public keeps getting misinformed on this by charlatans who you know, are presenting stuff about all oh, the aliens are abducting us and mutilating cattle and there are the good ones and the bad ones and they're all fighting in space in an intergalactic war. Well, that's all disinformation concocted and staged by the intelligence community. So everyone keeps getting diverted into rubbish and nonsense. What I'm concerned about is that the real issues that are sitting in front of us, we've got to come together as a people and fix. And the pressure is the earth there's this old saying, the earth will cast off her burden. We're the burden, and the earth is being really damaged severely by how we're living on the earth. But that's fixable. If you view this, there's a black box with all the technologies that would give us a civilization that's sustainable, peaceful, etc., and that's been around for decades. And we've got to find a way to come together and make that happen. But that's not of any use if we go with that kind of technology into a shooting war with these interstellar civilizations, which have not attacked us at all because they're not like that. They've evolved spiritually way beyond that. So I think that the, pre the, the, the pressure that I'm feeling is that, having been doing this for 30 years, is that I don't think we have 30 more years to waste. Uh, it doesn't matter about me personally, I'll be dead probably by then. But we just, the, the earth and our civilization cannot endure the kind of foolish behavior and wrong-headed living on this planet when, you know, we can create a whole new world. There are a lot of people who are putting information out that uh, is of questionable value. Uh, some people have done a very good job trying to move it forward. My biggest concern is people will take a lot of the evidence that we've collected, including some of the top secret witnesses, military and intelligence, and then they'll spin it into this false narrative of a threat. And that's what TTSA is doing. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of the, the people in the UFO subculture is doing. And the media covers that preferentially because the intelligence community that's embedded in the media wants that narrative out. They want a war this narrative a out. They want fear. They want this to be a freak show and a horror show. So if someone stands up and tells outrageous information and under the guise of disclosure people will just lap it up they just think oh wow look at that even though there's no foundation in fact or evidence for it I think it's terrifying I mean this seems potentially like one of the biggest stories of my lifetime and I don't care if it's about UFOs or whatever you call it something
that we don't understand is getting very close to our military aircraft and the government isn't responding adequately, and I hope you keep sounding the alarm on this. That's my concern. It isn't that there aren't people trying to do it. It's like, what wisdom is guiding that process? So I think that information is one thing, knowledge is another, wisdom is rarer. I think we have to approach this very wisely because we're playing with, we're playing with fire here. And, and the way that a lot of people are taking the um, disclosure information that we, we initiated and then repackaging it as a threat, that is my biggest concern because I know it's false. Can you tell us any insight, any secrets that could blow the lid off everything? I don't know if I can talk about it. Um, let, let me just say there are, I know of two factions within the intelligence community working to move this information out. You know, I recently had a phone call with a, a, a senior member of the intelligence community about, you know, these, these competing plans that are happening. And uh, there are some things in the offing in the next two or three months that if they come to play would be rather disturbing. Um, I'm hoping not, and I'm sort of consulting, starting to say let's, let's pull back on these worst, the sort of end of the world scenario hoaxes uh, that, 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 are, that are being planned. Uh, I think people, however, as Eisenhower said, we need an informed citizenry to avoid being deceived by excessive secrecy of, and I'm quoting, the military-industrial complex. So it's very important that people be informed, knowledgeable, and you know that's all you know. I, as one person, can do, and all of us can do. Can you tell me if you know what are the NASA protocols? If they discovered extraterrestrial life, would they even tell us? Well, look, Na NASA all along has mainly been window dressing. Um, as a space program because the people, most of the people in NASA are not in an, informed about the unacknowledged special access projects that have these man-made objects. And remember, document from the, the head of the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, the super secret engineering group. And he said, you know, because a friend of his handwritten letter said, what are these UFOs? and are they both ours and extraterrestrial? And Ben Rich, the director of the Skunk Works for Lockheed Martin wrote back, and I have this letter, and it says, they're both. They're ours that we're making and they're extraterrestrial. So that we have the proof for that in the handwriting of the senior director of the most secret aerospace contracting company in the world, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. So I tell people that that is the sort of information that we have to keep in mind and uh, not get diverted into being deceived too far. But when you hear that, you have to understand it's so easy to stage events that would, would, would deceive the public. And that's what we have to avoid at all costs. Do you think the public could handle it? Are we ready for disclosure? Look, the majority of, of, of the United States population believe the UFOs are real. They believe there's intelligent life out there. I don't think people are going to have a hard time with it if you have people explaining it and disclosing the information in a way that isn't alarmist. But if you look at what is mostly in the UFO subculture and mostly now being covered, unfortunately, by the media, it's very much this scary threat from outer space thing. So that would be catastrophic. That would be worse than 9-11, so uh, much worse. So I think it, it isn't whether people find out we're not alone, it's how it's explained, how it's presented. And I think if you're, if you're presenting it in a way that is alarmist and scares the hell out of people, that would be very damaging to the